Welcome to Holston Valley Unitarian Universalist Church. I am the Reverend Tiffany Sapp, the minister of this church, and my pronouns are she and her. Our opening hymn is number 134, which is in your gray hymnal. It's Our World is One World. So as the choir is coming on up here, I invite you to turn to number 134. You may rise in body or spirit and join us in singing 134 in the gray hymnal. part of you, O oh truth unfolding. I am part of you. I am part of the cosmos. I cannot see either its edge or its end. How amazing. I am part of a galaxy of a million billion stars. They say it's a pinwheel. How wonderful. I am part of a system of planets that swing around a small parent star. How strong the hands of invisible gravity must be to hold it all together just so. I am part of a planet, green and blue, along with mountains and seas, lichen and lava, robins and rain, periwinkles and perch, centipedes and cities. How great the variety. How astonishing the mutual dependence of it all. I am part of a species that belongs to a grouping of animals called mammalia, and so is every other human being, equally so. I am part of a political unit called a nation. There are many nations, each of them dear in many ways to its local citizens. I'm part of a family with ethnicity, practice, and love in the form of food rooted in these mountains. Others know other roots and other practices. I am part of a circle of friends rooted not in ethnicity or food, but in simple, redemptive love. I am part of a climate region, part of a state, part of a city, part of a neighborhood, part of a congregation, and part of a staff. And with you, I am part and parcel of this moment, this simple silence which lasts but a few breaths and then is gone forever. 
but like cosmos, galaxy, planet, species, nation, climate, city, neighborhood, family, and circle of friendship, it is precious, a present for which I give thanks. Please join me in a moment of silent contemplation as we prepare for our time together. amazing it is to be part of so many circles of connection, to find belonging in small groups and larger groups and even among all living things that share this planet. Today is Darwin Day. 214 years ago on this very day, Charles Darwin was born. His work on natural selection changed our world and his insights are closely linked to our seventh principle that celebrates the interconnectivity of all life and our fifth source, which counsels us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science. We Unitarian Universalists are not unique in our ability to integrate science into our worldview, but we might be unique in how much passion we bring to that task. And so we begin with the chalice lighting, with the words from Charles Darwin himself. You'll notice our chalice has migrated. Uh, your religious services committee has been thinking about how to use our space more safely. And so we are going to try our chalice up here for a while to see if it is a little bit less of a fire hazard. So, direct your gaze to the chalice as Tom shares Darwin's words from the very last paragraph in his seminal work on the origin of species. <clears throat> it is interesting to contemplate an entangled bank clothed with many plants of many kinds with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Tom Burns, and I'm your service leader. We welcome you, old friends and new, young and old, online and in person. You're an essential part of our gathering today, essential even to the evolution of our church. So if you're a walking fish, a fig wasp, or an immortal jellyfish, or perhaps even a blue-footed booby, we are stronger because of your presence. <laughs> We are one people of many philosophies, many origins, sexualities, and genders. We are all growing, learning, and loved. Just as you are, you are welcome here. Please silence your cell phones and observe the perfume-free perfume zone. Please allow personal space for service animals while the animals are in place. This week we are at medium risk. This means that masks are required when we meet together in a large group for Sunday worship, but that in smaller groups of vaccinated people, masks are optional. We will continue to have a YouTube option for people who cannot be here for whatever reason. And no matter what the risk level, we have color-coded wristbands so that you can indicate your distancing needs. It's especially important to stay home if you're not feeling well. Today we are inviting our kids, youth, and their parents to join us up here for our time of all ages, uh, where we are going to learn a little bit more about Darwin. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming down and hanging out with me today. Uh, today is Darwin Day. Does anyone want to tell me who Darwin is?
No one. Does anyone out there want to tell me who Darwin is? He came up with the theory of evolution. He came up with the theory of evolution. That's right. So about 200 years ago, Darwin went on a great adventure in a ship called the Beagle. What a great name for a ship. That ship sailed all around the world, but focused on South America. Darwin's job on the ship was to be the ship's naturalist, meaning that he collected samples of plants and animals and kept really good records to see what he could learn about the world around us. When he came to the Galapagos Islands, he discovered something amazing. And instead of trying to explain it myself, I found a video that does a much better job than I could do. What are Darwin's finches, and why are they so important to biologists? The study of finches led to the development of one of the most important scientific theories of all time. But how did this come about? In December 1831, a naturalist called Charles Darwin boarded the HMS Beagle bound on a surveying voyage to South America. Whilst the ship and crew carried out coastline surveys, Darwin was free to explore the islands en route. In 1835, the Beagle arrived at the Galapagos Islands near Ecuador. What Darwin found there surprised him greatly. As well as giant tortoises and marine iguanas, Darwin collected and preserved a variety of different songbirds called finches. Upon returning to the UK, he examined them together with ornithologist John Gould and made some fascinating discoveries. The scientists observed that the birds were all similar to a single type of finch found on mainland South America, suggesting that these mainland finches had originally colonized the island. However, the Galapagos finches were all slightly different from the original mainland species, and they were also different from each other. The finches on each island showed distinct variations in their overall size, beak shape, and claw size. These differences were attributed to the differing food sources available on the various islands of the Galapagos. Some of the birds had long thin beaks and sharp claws suited to catching and eating insects, while others had large powerful beaks suitable for cracking open nuts. Because of the distances between the islands, breeding between different species of finch was unlikely, and Darwin concluded that the finches must have evolved over time from the original mainland species to suit the conditions found on each individual island. In all, 13 of the birds brought back by Darwin were identified as being entirely new species, all similar to each other, but with definite variations from their common ancestor. Darwin proposed that the variations seen both within and between the finch species arose by chance. Variations which gave any individual a competitive advantage made them more likely to survive and therefore reproduce, outcompeting those with less advantageous characteristics. Darwin called this theory natural selection, and he published it in his book On the Origin of Species in 1859. Evolution by natural selection is now widely agreed to be the most accurate theory to explain the origin and diversity of all life on Earth. In this video, you have learned how the finches of the Galapagos Islands led to the development of the theory of evolution by natural selection. Is evolution of these birds still happening? See what you can find out. Well, I think that was a great summary of the theory of natural selection. That chance variations in size and beak shape allowed different birds to have advantages depending on what kind of food was available on their particular island. And when this happens, over a long enough period of time, new species evolve from this process. Now, I'm gonna ask this of everyone, not just the folks hanging out down here with me. Did you all know that some schools and some teachers don't want to teach evolution? Yeah. yeah. Why? 
Because because the Bible says because it makes them uncomfortable, and I've heard a few other shadier responses that my heart totally <laughs> agrees with. So some people believe that Darwin's discoveries, which are based on observation and logic, are not compatible with their religion. Do you think that Unitarian Universalists are part of the group of people who thinks evolution doesn't fit with our religion? No, that's right. Unitarian Universalists believe that the things that science, observation, and logic teach us should be part of our religion. And if science teaches us something different from our beliefs, then we are actually free to change our beliefs. So more than just being logical and true, though, I actually think that this science stuff can be really inspiring. A musician and a videographer named John Boswell agrees with me. He was so inspired by the teachings of science that he put together clips from nature shows and science lectures, and he auto-tuned them and put them to music <laughs> and created a video series called Symphony of Science. This is my favorite favorite nerdy thing in the world. One of his videos about evolution is our special music for today. And since I think y'all kids and big kids are going to enjoy this video so much, I'd like to invite you to stay right here on the floor with me for our special music. So this is an unbroken thread. Let's take a trip to examine this common basis of life, a voyage to investigate the molecular machinery at the heart of life on Earth. All life is related, and it enables us to construct with confidence the complex tree that represents the history of life. Our planet the Earth is, as far as we know, unique in the universe. It contains life. Here, plants and animals proliferate in such numbers that we still have not even named all the different species. Darwin's great insight revolutionized the way in which we see the world. We now understand why there are so many different species. Every cell is a triumph of natural selection, and we're made of trillions of cells within us is a little universe. Those are some of the things that molecules do. Given four billion years of evolution, we are, each of us, a multitude. Now, how did the molecules of life arise? It began in the sea some 3,000 million years ago. Complex chemical molecules began to clump together. These were the seeds from which the tree of life developed. They were able to split, replicating themselves as bacteria. The secrets of evolution are time and death. There's an unbroken thread that stretches from those first cells to us. The secrets of evolution are time and death. There's an unbroken thread that stretches from those first cells to us. us. Every cell is a triumph of natural selection, and we're made of trillions of cells within us is a little universe. Those are some of the things that molecules do. Given four billion years of evolution, we are, each of us, a multitude. It isn't the sharp line dividing humans from the rest of the animal kingdom. It's a very wuzzy line. It's a very wuzzy line. It's getting wuzzier all the time. We find animals doing things that we, in our arrogance, used to think was just human. It's a very wuzzy line, and it's getting wuzzier all the time. 
every cell is a triumph of natural selection, and we're made of trillions of cells in us is a little universe. Those are some of the things that molecules do. Given four billion years of evolution, we are each of us a multitude. Every cell is a triumph of natural selection, and we're made of trillions of cells in us is a little universe. Our planet, the Earth, is, as far as we know, unique in the universe. It contains life. Its continued survival now rests in our hands. How amazing is it to be connected to such a vibrant and diverse world? How amazing it is to be connected to each other as a community. Part of the way that we human animals have evolved is to build communities of mutual support. We show our support here in the lighting of candles and in the sharing of our joys and sorrows. With gratitude for this community, we share our joys and our concerns. If you'd like to share a joy or a concern in person, please use these candles cards that are located on the back table. And if you'd like to share a joy or a concern from a distance, please email minister at hvuuc.org. We have several people in our community sick and also recovering from in injury, and so we want to hold them in our hearts. Um, I have a joy. It smells amazing up here because of those daffodils. So thank you. I'm betting that was Beth. Thank you for those. Oh, it was not. It was the hatches. Thank you, Ray. There I go making assumptions. Thank you for those daffodils. They are amazing. I also have a pretty serious candle card. Uh, it's a candle of sorrow and anger for the transgender community in Tennessee. The Tennessee State Senate has passed a bill that's going to the House now that will ban all drag shows in public places as well as shows in spaces with people under the age of 18. This hateful bill was written so broadly that it has the potential to keep transgender and gender non-conforming people from going out in public at all and keeping transgender people from working as teachers and threatening churches that are home to transgender people. I am filled with a holy rage over this. And lighting a candle is not going to be enough. We can all call our legislatures right now. And if you are able to and want to go the extra mile, you can show up in Knoxville tomorrow at the Crutch Park Extension tomorrow at 5 p.m. for a protest. You can find more info on that at knoxpride.com or by visiting Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church's Facebook page for more information. If you wish to light your own candle, we invite you to go around and form a line by the window and Linda, a member of our caring team, will assist you. If you're on this side of the building, we ask that you please go around through the back door so that you don't pass in front of the camera. And if you wish for us to light a candle for you, please raise your hand until I acknowledge you and I will light a candle for you. And we light our first candle. For those of you who are not in the building, but are ever in our hearts and minds.
light a final candle for all that remains unspoken in our hearts and minds. Our reading is from the book, Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. In this passage, Alexis Pauline Gubbs tells the story of the orca whale and her love for them. If you let them tell it, before 1970, the orca, codenamed Blackfish, were despised. Military, military bases had guns pointed toward the water to kill them on sight for no nourishing reason. Teenage boys shot them with 22s and slashed them with knives and left them to die slow, painful deaths. And the adults in their communities applauded them for taking down the giant pest. What about post-1970 with the capture of Namu and her whole generation of southern resident orcas, mostly babies? If you let them tell it, thanks to oceanarium marketing, orcas are loved, meaning featured on posters, made into stuffed animals, starring as the main attraction at SeaWorld, marketable captives for capitalism, loved. I advocate for a different definition. I would say the orca before and after 1970 are influential. In matrilineal, multi-generational groups all over the planet, orca families influence all the other species in their range. They inspire seals to move onto land. They impact the migration of animals as varied as moose and humpback whales. In truth, the orca is a large dolphin, but there is no species on Earth too large not to fear her and give her respect. Orcas greet each other respectfully as distinct resident groups and celebrate their own social order. They collaborate on the care of their young. They are not afraid to express their grief for months and years in public. Yes, I would say the orcas are powerful, influential, necessary, nuanced and majestic, brave and committed. Those are the words I would use. What does it actually mean to love someone whose love leads generations? Ecosystems shape themselves around her. Great and small dream of her at night. What does it mean to love someone who has seen her children taken and at the risk of capture stayed to witness and scream? Who will not pretend that her heart is not broken when it is? Do we know how to love a love that that huge and unapologetic? Could we learn from that? What can we learn from the animals that we share this planet with. As perspectives on our place in the interconnected web of life continue to evolve, we are moving away from a hierarchical view that places humans as above and separate from the animal kingdom. We are beginning to see ourselves as part of the natural world once again. We are part of the tree of life. The evolutionary processes that spurred the oak tree to specialize in one area, mushrooms in another, and bears in another, are the same processes that spurred us to specialize into intelligent and adaptable tool-using animals. Of course, religions that say we humans are uniquely special in a hierarchical place just below angels and right above animals, of course they are threatened by Darwin's insights. But the Unitarians with their love of logic and their ability to adapt their thinking were early adopters of Darwin's theories. It probably didn't hurt that both Darwin's mother and his wife were British Unitarians, our cousins across the pond. 
Today then seems to be a great chance to examine how exactly humans have adapted and specialized to live so successfully in this world. We can learn more about these specializations by exploring similar evolutionary niches filled by other animals. The process of specialization is important because, quite frankly, Mother Nature is trying to kill us all. Yes, the natural world gives us beauty and awe, food and sometimes even therapy, but it also gives us disease and disaster and hungry animals that are bigger than us. So much of what we are today is based on how we have had to transform as a species to survive this world. The video said the secrets of evolution are time and death. All life on the planet is racing against the clock of death to reproduce and spread their DNA further into the world. Those species that have adapted and specialized in ways that let them live longer or reproduce more efficiently live on and their specialized advantageous genes continue to spread. While there may be a multitude of ways we humans have specialized to survive and spread, I want to really focus on two, our intelligence, and our communal nature. To some degree or another, the animal order of primates have all specialized in this way. But there are two non-primate species that have specialized in intelligence and community as well, and those unique species have really captured my imagination elephants and orcas with their ability to teach each other, their devoted family structures. These are the teachers I want to learn from today. The social structure of elephants is complex, political, and is largely dependent on the wisdom and experience of the herd matriarch. Around the age of 13, the male elephants go off to form their own herd that is generally run by the biggest, strongest male elephant. But the heart of the animal kingdom is the family herds that consist of the female elephants and their children. In these groups, usually all of the elephants are related and they are always led by the matriarch, the oldest and wisest elephant in the herd. The documentary series Elephant's Empire takes us through the journey of one family group of elephants in Botswana. And we see quickly how these family groups have intricate social structures to raise, protect, and teach young elephants. The matriarch's word is law and is oriented toward protection and sustenance. With vocal alerts, she can get the whole herd to circle up around the babies in a matter of moments. She also knows and remembers the best feeding and drinking places, and she knows how they change depending on if it's the wet season or the dry season. She takes them on the same paths that their elephant ancestors have walked for millions of years, and she passes this knowledge on to those who follow her. The matriarch also knows how to lift babies out of the mud during the wet season. New mothers in their panic of seeing their babies shoulder deep in sucking mud for the first time will react with their instincts to push at the babies with their trunks, which pushes them further into the mud. But grandma, with her years of experience, will literally body check the anxious mom out of the way so she can reach her trunk down and through the mud under the baby and lift them out. 
It is not instinct. Instinct pushes them further into the mud. This is a learned behavior. And every mother will learn this lesson from the herd matriarch in the most stressful on-the-job training you can imagine. During the dry season, there are other lessons that the matriarch teaches her herd. With minimal water available, all the nutrition in the grass retreats from the blades deep down into the roots of the plants, under the ground, and difficult to access by normal grazing. The matriarch teaches the other elephants how to pull the grass up out of the ground with their trunks, roots and all, and knock the dirt off of the roots either on the ground or their legs and only then eat the roots to get that nutrition. These are examples of complex learned tasks, intelligence and community united to give the herd the best chance for their babies to survive. Ecologist and elephant expert Caitlin O'Connell studied many family groups and many different elephant matriarchs, and she began to see how each had their own personality and leadership style. She noticed how the mortality rate of baby elephants really hinged on one factor, how many years of experience the matriarch possessed. Orca whales, with their beautiful black and white patterns and their terrifying predatory skills, also fill this intelligent and social niche in their own ecosystem. Orcas are so adaptable that different dialects of vocalizations and different hunting behaviors will be found in different pods throughout the world. They adapt to the food sources available, a callback to Darwin's finches that started us on this journey. A lot of research has been done on the southern resident pod. This is the pod referenced by Alexis Gums in our reading, whose close proximity to humans in the Pacific Northwest have not always been good for the pod. But they're there because that's where the salmon are. The southern residents pod's fate is tied to the salmon, and they are dramatically endangered now. Like the elephants, orcas don't have a large number of babies, but rather each reproducing female has a calf about every six years, and she's not, and she's fertile long enough to have about four or five in her lifetime. That's not a lot. Like the elephants, the focus is instead on raising those calves well, with strong bonds and a lot of social strategies for survival, a strategy that we humans share with these remarkable mammals. Also like the elephants, orcas are matriarchal and pods are made almost entirely of family. For the southern resident pod, the salmon hunting orcas are taught by the matriarch how to hunt, and where, and when. She knows the most fertile fishing grounds, and she knows how they shift with the seasons. And she personally catches the most salmon. She shares up to 90% of the fish that she catches with others. Grandma's working hard, y'all. In fact, Molly Hansen and her study of orcas, uh, as published in the article The Grandmother Effect, observed that grandmother whales were more beneficial to the pods when they stopped reproducing themselves. Because their focus shift from caring for individual calves to feeding all of the grand calves that needed it. She said that the study shows that if a whale lost its grandmother, its survival rate took a sharp decline within two years. And this was even true for 20 year old whales. I guess there is no age limit on grandma's care. 
Hansen says that in these animals, natural selection was decided, has decided that post-reproductive grandmas are an extremely valuable resource for keeping the species going. It is truly rare for female mammals to continue living after menopause. In most cases, natural selection favors species that keep on producing babies right on to the very end. But it's not so with orcas. With orcas, these wise elders who trade in reproduction for community care are the most important part of the pod, hands down. And as a human, where so many of us contribute to the well-being of the species without reproducing, I really appreciate that. Kristen Hawkes studied the human side of this equation in an origin stories podcast called The Grandmother Hypothesis. She's an anthropologist and spent time learning from the Hatsa people in Tanzania who still live in close family groups as hunters and gatherers. She noticed that even though the hunters would bring in the big deal food that was cause for celebration, it was actually the consistent, predictable food that came from gathering tubers that actually kept the community fed. Just as grandmother orcas that would share 90% of their catch with their grandchildren, with humans, the lion's share of the tubers gathered were gathered by grandmothers and used to feed their grandchildren. This allowed the mothers to focus on raising their newest high maintenance baby, while the grandmothers did quite a bit to care for all the other kids and even teach them some of these foraging skills in the process. Kristen Hawkes used her observations to theorize that the existence of grandmothers and the biological patterning of women to lose their reproductive abilities around the same time that their children were able to become parents themselves could perhaps be a key part of our evolutionary advantage as well. Our ability to care for each other in community is perhaps why our species is one of the most abundant upon the earth. It seems that whether we're elephants, orcas, or humans, part of being highly intelligent specialists with a social orientation is that we commit more resources to raising and teaching our young. And we treat raising our young as a communal effort rather than an individual effort. I look at the pressures that modern life is putting on all of us, and I think that helping each other raise the next generation is one of the most important things that we can do. The model that says that parents can do everything for their kids alone is not only exhausting, but it's not supported by our evolutionary journey. Fortunately for us humans, there is no need for our communal child raising to fall along gender lines or even family lines. We have wise elders everywhere we look. And oh my gosh, does that line land differently as I'm looking out at all of you. These wise, wise leaders, wise elders, all help our species thrive in the interconnected web of life. Unlike our elephant cousins and our orca cousins who depend on their herd and pod elders to learn a few specific skills, we humans have found our evolutionary advantage and even more complex social skill structures with highly specialized functions. Intelligence and social bonds are still key, but the application of them is more varied. With teachers and scientists, bus drivers and doctors, food preparers and vehicle manufacturers, and so many others. And this means that we actually have a lot of wise elders specializing in a lot of different areas.
And some of our wise elders might not even be that old. It all just depends on how much time we have spent learning our particular specializations and what teachers, mentors, and resources we have found along the way. So think about it. What wisdom, experience, and knowledge do you bring to this pod of humans here at Holston Valley Unitarian Universalist Church? And what wisdom, experience, and knowledge do you still need to gather up and bring home with you? And where do you need help? How can you lean on your community? I have benefited from wise elders that have taught me about communication, technology, feminism, management, LGBTQ allyship, courage, authenticity, music, showing up for social justice, and so many other things. And not all of my teachers have been older than me, though many absolutely have been. We humans have evolved to be intelligent and social, and sometimes we have done horrible things with that power. And sometimes we have done truly magnificent things with this power. In this place, may we always use our power responsibly, raise our community's children together, and look to the wisdom of our elders. <clears throat> the law of evolution is that the strongest survive. That's true. And the strongest in the existence of any social species are those who are most social, in human terms, most ethical. There is no strength to be gained from hurting one another, only weakness. Thank you for being with us today. We hope you'll stay for coffee hour. We also hope you might take a look at some of the ways to make, this, to make social connections outside of this time and place on Sunday mornings. This Friday night, there's a game night for anyone who wants to make some friends and play some games. You can find more information about that on our website under events, or you can just show up at the res up the hill at 6.30 this Friday night. If you're visiting us today, we're especially grateful for your presence. If you want to learn more about us and you're here in person, please go visit the visitor's table, pick up a brochure and sign the visitor's book. If you're online, you can get more information by emailing us or by visiting our website. And I'd like to invite you all to check out religious education classes up the hill in our religious education building. And that happens every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. We have classes for the kids and for the adults, and it's a great way to learn from each other and strengthen our community. Another way to learn from each other and strengthen our community is in our upcoming Article 2 workshop, where we will take a deep dive into the proposed revisions to an important part of Unitarian Universalist identity. There will be an in-person workshop after church on March 5th and a Zoom one the following Tuesday evening, March 7th. You can visit the events page of our website for more information, or you can just show up. I am so glad that we could be together today, and I hope you'll join me next week as we talk about the golden rule. In our commitment to pluralism, we'll explore how we see the threads of the golden rule woven throughout a variety of religious traditions, and then we'll take a look to see if there's even a better rule out there to help us think about how to live ethically together. When contemplating humanity's relationship with the natural world, naturalist and writer Henry Beston said this, we need another and a wiser and perhaps more mystical concept of animals. 
Remote from universal nature and living by complicated artifice, man in many civilizations survey the creature through the glass of his knowledge and sees thereby a feather magnified and the whole image in distortion. We patronize them for their incompleteness, for their tragic fate of having taken form so far below ourselves. And therein we err, and we greatly err. For the animal shall not be measured by man. In a world older and more complete than ours, they move, finished and complete, gifted with extensions of the senses we have lost or never attained, living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren. They are not underlings. They are other nations caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and the travail of earth. So as we go from this place, let's love this web and our place in it. Let's love those wise animal teachers that are caught in the web with us, that we can care for each other across the generations, whether we be in herds or pods or churches. Like the elephants and the orcas, it's our ability to create community bonds that gives us humans such an advantage. And this community needs your financial support to keep doing its work to help our species survive. So as we sing our closing hymn, please give generously to help us keep on doing what we're doing. Our closing hymn for this month is Blue Boat Home, number 1064 in the Teal Hymnal. Please rise with us in body or spirit for our closing hymn, Blue Boat Home, number 1064.